morning, church. This morning, I want to share with you what we are doing about a project that is starting tomorrow. It's a very exciting project, and we want you to be aware of what's happening. There's a church in Pretoria East by the name of 3CR. They've been having church for the last 13 years in a tent, and tomorrow, that tent is coming down. That's what it looks like. Tomorrow, you and I are paying for that tent to start coming down. They're taking this tent down because they're busy with a new building project on that site. And so they've given us this tent. It's been incredible to see how God has been so kind to us as a church. So those containers will be used. And we're going to be taking the tent down and, and putting it into those containers until one, one, one day. And I was, there's another picture there. Thanks, Mark. That's uh, the containers waiting to start the project tomorrow. I was telling somebody this week what this project is all about, about the tent coming down and the containers that we've bought. And, and they looked at me this week and the expression on their face said it all. It was like, it was something like, yeah, but I, they were looking at me the other way. It was like this, <laughs> like, like that. And, and, and I, I mean, that gave it away. It was them saying in their mind, but showing it through their facial expression, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And I asked my teammates on Tuesday night, a team night, I said to my teammates, what is the Afrikaans word for ridiculous? And I love it because it rolls off your tongue. It's a nice that Afrikaans language, eh? Yeah, belachlik. <laughs> That's belachlik. It's a ridiculous idea. And so this morning we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 6. You can open your Bibles or your smartphone to Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to try and find this word ridiculous in our series that we are using called Move because we're all moving forward in our lives, following Jesus on the straight road. We're putting the bars and beams and bolts in place on those gates in our lives as we move forward into what Jesus has for your life as a husband, Jacques, and for us as a church. Nice to have the lawyer here, AD. Good to have you back here. But I saw your sign at Northern's there. Lack of sign there, but Nehemiah chapter 6. Before we open up God's word, let's ask Jay to pray for us. Let's just close our eyes. Father God, thank you for another Sunday. And yeah, Lord, your ways are, are not our ways. And things that we might think are ridiculous, Lord, we ask you to open our hearts and to open our minds to, to your word this morning. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that, Jay. Nehemiah chapter 6. I don't know if it has a title on the top of your smartphone there at the beginning of that chapter, but in your Bible there might be a, a subtitle there. Does it say something there, Jerry, on that smartphone? Because in my Bible it says there, further opposition to the rebuilding. Further opposition. It's always going to be opposition. Further opposition to the rebuilding. Verse 1, when the word came, sorry, if you don't have your Bible, it's your loss. You've got to bring your Bibles to church. It's not on the screen. This is a training center here in this tent. We're training each other as we apply the word of God in our lives. When the word, of, when the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, when they heard that I had rebuilt the wall, this is Nehemiah speaking, and not a gap was left in that wall, though up to that time, I had not set the doors in the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come. I wonder what tone of voice they used. Come. Try and entice him. Come. Let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Oh No. They have a hidden agenda because they're not happy with what Nehemiah is doing. They want to distract him from what's going on with the building of the walls. So he says to them with this reply, Nehemiah says, I'm carrying on a great project. I cannot, I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Point number one, whenever you and I decide to move forward for God in our lives, there will be opposition. There will always be opposition when we decide to move in a direction for God. I met a man at Wimpy Head Office this week for a breakfast He's going through an extremely difficult time in his work environment. He's facing massive opposition right now because he has been falsely accused. 
And, and this, these false accusations have led to head office from overseas coming in now to do a massive investigation. They've hired hotshot advocates and lawyers as they accuse this man. And the man who started all these allegations lives in the north in his fast car in a nice big house. Not as fast as that Ferrari on Friday and around Kalami, but nevertheless, fast car. He lives his life at peace. And this man who's been falsely accused, facing massive opposition, lies awake at night, full of anxiety. And this man has a decision to make. The world is telling him, hire five hotshot advocates and lawyers to defend you. Do an investigation on that man. Let's bring out the dark skeletons in that man's closet. Is he going to face opposition with God and do it God's way? Yes, he'll need a lawyer. But is he trusting God for one lawyer? Is he trusting God that in fact when he sees that man at the office tomorrow morning, that God will prepare a table in the presence of his enemy? He's got to make a decision as he faces opposition. You and I will always face opposition. Because the world says do it this way. And he's making a decision to do it God's way. And it sounds ridiculous, man. But look, look. But this man's trusting God. My friends, I want to say to us, and we want to implement things in our lives to follow God on the straight road and follow Jesus as a Christian, there will be massive opposition. Let's just uh, turn back there to Nehemiah chapter 4. Go two chapters back to Nehemiah chapter 4 quickly. And you'll see at the top of chapter 4, what does it say there? Massive opposition to the rebuilding of the walls. When we take steps closer to Jesus, there will be opposition over and over and over again. Here there's opposition again, verse 1 of chapter 4. When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the walls, he became angry, and look what it says, and ridiculed the Jews. There's our word there, ridiculed. Ridiculous. What these Jews are doing are ridiculous. When we make a decision to move forward for God, and build the walls of our lives and put the gates with their bars and beams and bolts in place. People will say, it's ridiculous. Not just your enemies, but sometimes your colleagues, sometimes your friends, and sometimes your family will look at the decisions that you are making and think, that is absolutely belachelijk. In Santon, it goes something like this. Hey, doll, are we going to Nanda to watch the horses on Sunday? You know, the polo. <laughs> and no, doll, I'm, uh, I'm going to church. Again, you said they'd laugh with my tone of accent there, Cass. They're not laughing at that one. <laughs> let, me, let me try this one. In Pretoria, it goes something like this. Hey, but, Sunday, we're going to Broncos Pride, dump to a bit of a ski, a bit of a fish fang to find out. Come here, Sam, that's all. Broncos Pride, dump to and Ibanoni, it goes something like this. Hey bud, you're cutting your bike ride short on a Sunday again to go to church. You could do 100 Ks, you're cutting your bike ride short to go to church. Yeah, bud. But at least I get to come to church in my cycling kit and hang my bike outside and get a cappuccino. <laughs> Are you sure there's not a cult happening in that school hall there, bud? Because I've heard about this church in that hall. There will always be opposition when we make a decision for Jesus. Can you imagine Noah? God says to him, uh, Noah, build that boat. Nowhere near the Vol Dam, nowhere near Hearties, nowhere near Broncos Sprite. You know that small little dam there in Rhinefield, Ibotsi, you know that dam there, but build it there in the park there. Next to that steam engine, there's a monument. Build it there. And the Lanis drive out of their houses early morning as the sun comes up and there's Noah building the boat. Ah, it's ridiculous. It's okay. And they come home late at night when the sun goes down and there's Noah with his headlights on building the boat. Mad this oak man, what's he up to? Year after year after year, 
after year. It's ridiculous. And they're sitting on their patios overlooking the golf course over the boundary wall. There's that oak again, carrying on year after year after year, building the walls. But look, look, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your energy. And people look at us in 2019. The Bible's outdated. Church, you're going to church. Church is for the weak, man. Why are you going to church again? But when the rain started to fall, then I wonder what they said looking at Noah. Maybe your friends are those people that are rejoicing right now because of how life is treating them now. Living life to the full now. Experiencing life now. Maybe they are rejoicing now and they're looking at us. And maybe they can carry on laughing at us because of the way we are living, friends. Because of the straight road that we're deciding to walk on as Christians. Moving forward by building the walls of our lives and putting the gates with their bars and beams and bolts in place. But one day, the church will rejoice And they may not be rejoicing with us. If we build God's kingdom His way, if we build His church His way, friends, it's going to sound absolutely ridiculous. Why don't they plant another church in Benoni? (laughs) There's so many churches in Benoni. Why? In a school hall. It's ridiculous. They're taking a a tent down from another church that's been up for 13 years. It leaks. It does leak. (laughs) But but, but it only leaks when it rains, okay. (laughs) And they've they've bought three containers. They don't even know where they're going to put these containers because they say maybe, maybe, maybe one day they'll get a piece of land where they can put that tent up. Do they know how much land costs? Ridiculous. It's balachlik. There's a lot of ridiculousness in that tent idea. Unless we believe. Unless we believe. Do we? Friends, do we believe? Do we really believe? That God can touch marriages and restore broken people's lives? Do we really, really believe that God can break through into one person's life who feels lost and empty and vulnerable and searching for something and never finding satisfaction? Do we believe? Do we believe that the Holy Spirit can move and empower people and train people and call them up to live godly Christian lives? Do we really Believe that, friends. Unless we believe that God can do that, that tent idea is absolutely ridiculous. I want to say to you, Freedom Church, this project to build a community of Jesus followers that we are involved with is not ridiculous. I want to say to you, you are not wasting your time. You are not wasting your resources. We are busy with a great project. Just like Nehemiah said in chapter 6, I'm busy. With a great project, I cannot come down. I will not be distracted because of the project that God is busy doing. And it's His projects, not our projects. Come up here, be read. I want to share with you. But maybe you uh, you don't know this guy. He grew up in an incredible home, amazing upbringing. Mom and Dad, who are Incredible pillars of strength to him and his sisters. And, and then through circumstances, my mate b got involved in uh, drug addiction and shouldn't actually be alive today. But God saved him. And God did something supernatural in Brad's life. God, God took b a, a burnt stone, a broken stone, and did a supernatural work in his life. And when I look at you, Brad, and as we discuss building a project with a tent down the, down the line, I want to say to you, but the enemy keeps me awake at night saying, do you really believe that God can take someone like you? Do you really believe that God can turn this man's life around? Do you really believe that, Brad, you can start playing a role for God and that God can use you to impact many other young adults in this city? But do you really believe, Daryl, that Brad can start shining his light and start preaching on a Friday night with many other young adults about another king, 
where Brad's preaching with many other young adults about another king that is way more rewarding and fulfilling to serve than sex and drugs and rock and roll, about another king, and his name is Jesus. God does incredible things in people's lives. And Brad, and Brad I love you, bud. And every time I see you and spend time with you, you give me hope and you remind me that God is busy in people's lives. We love you. Let's give God just glory today. Shot bits. This is uh, what it says here in Zechariah chapter 11. It's, not, it's on the board. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Then I took two staffs, and I called one favor and the other union, and I pastured the flock. It's a negative context there because there are leaders who are abusing God's people. And I pray that, that we will never abuse God's people in this school hall. There are many leaders who abuse God's people. I pray we will never abuse God's people in this school hall and at church. Put on the next verse there for us, please, Mark. This is what Jesus says, for I'm going to raise up a shepherd over this land who will not care for the lost or seek the young or heal the injured or feed the healthy, but will eat the meat of the choice sheep tearing off their hooves. Keep it us there for us, Fireball. Nice having you on AV with us. This is what bad leadership looks like. And if we had to swing that, that around and speak the opposite of that, then we would get a picture of what good leadership looks like. We are laying a foundation here, friends, at Freedom Church in this hall way, 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 way long before one day that tent will be put up. That verse there says, the shepherd will not care for the lost. That means that if you are lost, you are coming to this place where it's got actually nothing to do about the building. You are coming to a community where there are people here that will love you if you lost. If you lost morally. If you lost emotionally. We will be careful with you when you come into this church. The second thing up there in that text say, that we want to do the opposite to. It says care for the young. And, and looking over this Hall this morning, there's a, a lot of old youth of yesterday. Can I say it like that? We honor you, the youth of yesterday. There's a lot of you sitting here in this school hall, and we honor God for you because within the youth of yesterday, there's a lot of faithfulness, there's a lot of wisdom, a lot of history. But at Freedom Church, we also want to seek the young. This needs to be a church where young people get heard not just seen. Amen? We're going to honor the millennials. Now that word millennial, there's always a negative connotation to that. Hey, I've got a couple of friends who are millennials. They get ripped off because of their lack of concentration. Whew. They get ripped off because their lack of commitment, man. They get ripped off because they don't have grit. Do what it takes. I've got a friend. He's a millennial. He gets sponsored protein uh, powder. But because it's a bit um, lumpy, no, he won't, he won't take it. And so I'm like, bud, I'll buy it from you, but no, it's lumpy. I, I, I don't like the millennials. Fussy. Lack of commitment, lack of faithfulness, all those things. And sometimes the millennials battle to move on, but we're going to seek the young. How are we going to do that, friends? As a church, how are we going to seek the young? I think it's easy to draw young people to church. Oh, maybe that sounds a bit arrogant, Daryl. Put up big lights, a lot of sound. I was with two architects and an engineer from Freedom Church this past week in the tent in Pretoria. And they were talking to me about lights and perhaps what we need to do with sound, etc. And one of them said, you know what? It's actually got nothing to do with the lights. It's actually got nothing to do with the sound. Friends, I want to draw young people to God at Freedom Church by giving them an example that is real and radical and relational. Where they look at people just a few years older than them and say, hey, that oak, the way he's treating his wife is real. He's not fake. 
I saw a man this week and said, I don't want to be part of a church that's fake. Neither do I. I want to be part of a church that's real, man. Where the millennials look at us and say, wow, something different about how they're choosing to live. Number three, the third thing it says, it says, and heal the injured. We're going to build a church where God heals the injured. And sometimes people walk into these doors. This morning we used the side doors. We walk in tough. I'm okay. I've got my mask on. But underneath all of that, there's injury and there's brokenness. And there's like a little bird that's just coming so frail and fragile. We want to build the walls of a church where people can heal. Where God heals people emotionally. Where people get touched spiritually. And where God heals people physically. And number four, it says, where we feed the healthy. Looking across this hall, I think 85% of you are healthy. You don't just want to come to church every Sunday hearing about the broken and, and people that are in trouble. You actually want to be fed. You actually want to grow spiritually and get nourishment out of God's word. Friends, we call to be doctors. You are called to be a lawyer. You are called to be an IT specialist. God has created you to be a project manager or an entrepreneur. He has given you that gifting. And in order to fulfill that gifting, Monday to Saturday, we got to be fed spiritually. Feed the healthy. So when you leave church on a Sunday... And you've had a coffee and you open the door for your wife and you get into the car. You should actually look at her and say, my heart is warm today. I feel fed. I needed to hear that message. Not from man, but from God's word. Why are you and I in the marketplace, friends? Ask yourself that question. Last week, I shared that story about that lady at a big corporate in, in her department. Here's about a man from the factory, been there many years, passes away. Sorry, HR says, no funeral policy. But she fights for what's right. And she goes to her boss. And things in HR get turned around. So much so that HR says, we'll actually send a bus for colleagues and family to that man's funeral. I shared that story, but I was cross because I didn't ask you this question last week. Are you and I showing godly principles out there in the world? Or are the world's principles starting to influence you and I? Why are we out there, friends, showing godly principles to our friends and our colleagues in the marketplace? Here's the reality, though. People are going to look at us and they're going to say, that's ridiculous. The way that person is living is balachlik. Doesn't make sense to the world. You know what else it says up there? It says we won't rip off their hooves. We won't tear off their hooves. We will not rip people off. We've got to be part of a community here at Freedom Church, friends, where we won't rip people off. And maybe in 10 15, 20, maybe 30 years time, you decide, you know what, my season at Freedom Church has come to an end. I pray that you will never say, you will never be able to say that the elders and, and team at Freedom Church ever ripped you off. We're not going to rip people off. Here at Freedom Church, every burnt stone that walks into this church, we will try as best as we can to facilitate a place where we point people to Jesus Christ. You know, often people will go to a counselor and say, I need you to help me. I need you to, to give me advice. We want to point people to Jesus, the ultimate healer and source where we really do live life to the full. You still got your Bible open? Go, go back to Nehemiah chapter 4. Keep it open there because we're going to be in Nehemiah quite a bit this morning. Chapter 4, verse 3. You with me? Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side said, What they are building, even if a fox climbed on it. My name's in the Bible. Even if a fox climbed on it. A skinny little fox climbs on that wall that's going to break. That wall of stones. In other words, they are building something so stupid, man. That thing, those, those walls are so weak. Belachlik. It is ridiculous what they are actually doing. And Nehemiah replies, and he says this, Hear us, O God, 
turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sin from your sight, God, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. They have told us, the builders, that we're ridiculous. So we rebuilt the wall until it reached half its height, for the people worked with all of their heart. Say half the heart. All their heart. Half the heart. But all, but, but half, the, half the heart, but all their heart, man. They're working with all of their heart. And the walls are only half the heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble. But we prayed. But we prayed. One of my mates at Freedom Church said, Darrell, we're not praying enough for the future of Freedom Church. We got to pray. Nehemiah says, but we prayed. But we prayed to our God and we posted a God day, God there day and night to meet this threat. Friends, I want to say this. Half the heart, but all their heart. They're working with all of their heart, but they're only halfway there. The wonderful thing about us taking this tent down from tomorrow is that actually we're not concerned about the tent. And actually we're not concerned about land. All we're doing right now is working with all of our hearts, believing that God can touch that marriage, but believing that God can restore that man. We're giving everything we have, working with all of our hearts. And sometimes I get concerned because they say, do you know how much finance you're going to need for the tent and the land one day? I don't want to look at that, friends. I want to be giving all of my heart right now to see that man be restored and to see that person get on the straight road living for Jesus. Have you ever given all of your heart into something? Work with all of your heart. God, I've given my whole heart into this business, but I'm only halfway out of debt. I've given all of my heart to this relationship, but he's only half in. And I've given all of my heart. I've sacrificed my whole heart for my son and his future, but he's the only Half in. Can you relate to that, friends? Giving everything of your heart to something. And the results are only halfway. At Freedom Church, friends, we're doing everything with all of our hearts, investing into people's lives where it's actually got nothing to do with the building. So that the lost can be cared for, so that we can seek the young, where the injured get healed by God and not man, and where the healthy are fed spiritually and are nourished from God's word. A training facility where nobody is ever, ever ripped off. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 8 as we close this morning. You must turn there, please. The walls have been completed. It's taken them just 52 days to build those walls. Massive project. But it took Nehemiah four months before that project started to pray. Four months of prayer and fasting and committing that project to God one day. And this is where they're at. The walls have now been completed. Verse 16. So after the walls were completed, the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters, tents. The people built temporary shelters. They built tents on top of their own roofs, in their courtyards, and in the courts of the house of God. And in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters. Everybody built temporary shelters. They built tents and they lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this. And read that line, and their joy was very great. Their joy in their tents 
was very great. I want to say to us, Freedom Church, as we build a foundation long, long, long before that tent ever gets put up somewhere, let's build a foundation here as a community that is based on prayer. Let's build a foundation where burnt stones are brought back to life. Let's build a foundation where people volunteer and serve, not because they have to, but because they want to be involved in a great project. And let's work on this foundation with all of our heart and not worry about only half the heart. Let's work together with Jesus, the real Nehemiah of heaven, who came down and prepares a table in the presence of your enemy where he can restore your marriage, where miracles happen in a place where all glory is given to him. In Jesus' name, amen.